get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have one of the top innovators in cancer research, Dr. Craig Dion. He's co-founder of Genspera, where they develop cutting-edge cancer treatments. He's over 25 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry and has served for years at a biopharmaceutical company where he was responsible for its oncology and neurobiology drug discovery programs. He's also served as executive vice president at the Prostate Cancer Research Foundation, and his research has led to six issued patents and many scientific papers. Craig, Dr. Dion, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure. I look forward to this. Yeah, and you know, what's interesting through my research is, which we'll get into, you've developed and or further developed a powerful plant, the use of a powerful plant-derived molecule that works directly on tumors, which we'll go into. And we're going to talk about some of the challenges, the clinical trials, what it takes to get a life-saving drug to market. You know, this is exciting stuff. But first, I have to start with a fun fact. You know, there, there's a couple of fun facts about you. One is sometimes you like to research up until 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning on different discoveries. So I'm curious, what is your best or favorite discovery that you had in the late evening at 3 a.m.? Oh, uh, this one, uh, this goes back a few years, but we were developing a drug to block blood vessel growth to stop tumors from growing. Yeah. And it normally takes six months to know if it works. Could I devise uh, a technique where I can determine in one day if the drug is working? Am I at the right dose? And I figured out a way to do that by measuring eyeball uh, pressure. Like eyeball you pressure. Glaucoma or glaucoma. And it was really good. It worked well in animals. We didn't get it to work in humans. But it was a sort of a bizarre approach, but a very, you know, shortcut to get data. Yeah. You're always looking for ways to get it done faster. You know, and, and Craig, you know, what's interesting about that is whether it's a biopharmaceutical company, biotechnology company, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneur looking for his company, it's all about innovation and research. What do you find, where do you look for, for research and innovation? Oh, uh, that almost always goes to the individual who's out there thinking in a big picture way. Yeah outside of the box, and you find those individuals. Yeah. I, I'm lucky to have some at, at Hopkins. Other yeah, people who do you follow are, and listen to? You know, uh, a personal mentor, Josie Schlesinger, uh, was fantastic. He's a National Academy. He was one of my bosses early in my career. Yeah. Uh, just always had the big, big picture. John Isaacs, who's the co-founder in our company, yeah. who developed the technology that we're mm-hmm. developing, always had a rule to take a step back and said, if we know nothing, start with the white sheet of paper, how would we devise a cancer drug? Mm. And that's how we've come into these technologies. Those are the individuals that do it. It's, it's usually a quite a different approach than anyone else. Yeah. So the first one from John Hopkins, what big lesson did he teach you? Passion yeah. and enthusiasm and keep at it. He's devoted his life to working in prostate cancer, trying to find cures. And the word enthusiastic and inspiration is what he values most and in, in, in tries to create that in his colleague. Mm-hmm. It's a long, hard road. You've got to really believe. Right. No. What was the time? Yeah. And I think it's important for anyone to have that sounding board. What was the time where you called him? because it is a long, hard road, and he kind of motivated you and maybe talked you down from the ledge. <laughs> <laughs> so I brought, to, to give you a little history, I brought this technology from Hopkins, which yeah. is where John Isaacs works, yeah. uh, into my former company, Cephalon, to, for us to license it and work mm-hmm. on it. And everybody told us it was a bad idea, they didn't want to do it. That was a turning point for me to say, hey, I, this culture of no risk is not for me. Yeah. So. I left, brought the technology into Genspera. Well, 
four years later, we still hadn't raised any money in the company. I had no personal income. Children are in school. And that's tough. Really, what yeah. it is tough. That's a low point. And you say, but we're friends. And, it, and his point is correct. We keep your eye on, on, on the mission. This yeah. is what we're going to do when we're finished with this. We're going to yeah. cure patients. And it was really that constant encouragement. Of course, we got through that with data. I found other people that could help us financially. Mm-hmm. And then the rest is history. But it's tough when you've got a family and there's no income for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And Craig, that's what keeps you up till 3 a.m., right? I mean, that <laughs> you have a good you I mean, it is, There's no better mission than creating one of these drugs because you know the faster you create it, the more you save lives uh, with it, which we'll get into. Um, the other fun fact I written down was what was it like meeting Henry Kissinger? That was uh, <clears throat> an experience, a very recent experience, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, what an intelligent individual that just comes across. You can agree with what he says or disagree, but it's well thought through and just a, a giant of our age. But if you ask my children, they don't know who he is. But for our generation, that, he played a big role. So what did you chat about when you were with him? I always try to give him a few good ideas. You know, I had to look up when I saw the picture of you and him. I was like, is that the Henry Kissinger? And I had to actually go to Google Images and, and see if that was, maybe it was a different Henry Kissinger, but that was the Henry Kissinger. That was the real one. I actually met him previously about three years ago at a restaurant in New York. Mm, just randomly? Just Happen to be sitting next door at the next table. Wow, that's crazy. So, Craig, you know, I want to get into some of those, the challenges, clinical trials, but I want to go back early on to where you grew up and what was a big influence for you? Oh, I grew up in South Louisiana, uh, south of New Orleans in a place called Thibodeau. It's surrounded by water. Everybody has a boat. Everybody has great seafood. It's a Cajun culture. It's a mm-hmm. wonderful, wonderful place to live. You know, I saw LSU, you did your BS at LSU. So then what brought you to Texas for your PhD? Uh, I always knew I wanted to be a biochemist. That, that you did? Me. Yeah, that's since early in high school. And, and Why Texas, biochemistry? I, I was going to ask what you wanted to be when you grew up. Why biochemistry? Um, I like biochemistry. I just like to understand how things work. It's to me, just fascinating that a single fertilized egg can turn into a human being. It is amazing. And all the things that have to happen in just a very, very complicated way. It's a single thing that will make me religious, is understanding that this didn't happen by accident. And But just understanding that the interface with biology and chemistry, um, I find fascinating because using chemistry is how we make drugs now and intervene in the, in the biological process. Right. You know, I remember because I actually was a biochemistry major also, and I remember calling my parents when I was in college and go, what should I do with this? Like, what did I do later? So what were you thinking when you're in college? What did you want to go on to do? That's actually a, a really good question. You know, it starts early, and I always figured that I would be an academic scientist. I'd never make any money, and I'd generate information. Right. And then the career changes, and I go to industry, and I realize. I'm not that interested in doing just manuscripts and more knowledge. How do we use that knowledge to make drugs? And that very few people have the vision or the skill set or determination to do it. A narrow focus thing and not become so multidimensional like in making drugs. So what did you learn after school? So what was interesting that I saw is you have a heavy philosophy background. Right. What was philosophy? Right. (laughs) Or is that a misprint? I don't know if I have a philosophy background. I have a a PhD, but that's about it. (laughs) So, after your PhD, what did you do? I did a postdoc, postdoctoral training at Dana Farber Cancer Institute with a joint appointment at Harvard Medical School. Yeah. And was there for about four years, and that was actually a turning point in my career too, because that's when I realized what academics was like and the search for publications as opposed to the search for really trying to utilize that knowledge and make drugs. And so that was where I transitioned say, I'm going to go to industry and, and do, do my career path in that fashion. Mm-hmm. 
And then you went on, like we talked about in the intro, um, where you were responsible for the oncology and neurobiology drug discovery program. What were some of the big milestones or things you learned uh, while you were there? A um, couple of things. One is when I joined Cephalon, they were a neuroscience company only. Mm. But I had some ideas about how we could use certain molecules there for oncology. And because we had a CEO who would eventually listen to me because we had data that I could generate, uh, we actually turned the company into oncology as well. But during mm. that, so that was a very, and I, you know, we had corporate partners. It was a lot of money that poured into the company. A lot of, I would say, validation of me as a scientist. So that part was real good. But the other thing you learn is a mistake I made early was not building teams well enough. Hmm. In this business, everything depends on teams. And it took me a, a few mistakes before I realized that everything we do now, you, you assemble team and allow those people to, to hold the baby and nurture the baby, so to speak, so that everybody's involved in the process in the mm -hmm. very beginning. So what did you not do then that you do now with building teams? Oh, man, everybody gets a piece of the action. But, you know, this is a seven to ten year process. So even before you start on the basic research, you want to know what the drug is going to look like. What are the trial designs? So you engage those people who run clinical trials and, and then the people, you know, that, that formulate drugs, you get them all engaged. More importantly, though, it's not that you get their advice, you get their involvement. Mm -hmm. And you let them know that they are much more important than you are. In the, in the success story, and it's gonna be their success story too. Mm -hmm. So it takes a, take a step away from your ego and let these people shine. You'll need them. So before you take more of a compartmental approach, you just focus on what you're doing then with the building the team, and now you, you look take a long-term vision, or what, what mistakes did you make early on? Uh, thinking that I could do more than I could, or that when I get mm -hmm. to the next problem, I'd enroll the next expert. Right. Um, it's better to get them lined up early yeah, and get their advice early. Don't, don't walk and then find the next guy. Get them all on the team from day one. Mm -hmm. um, now, you've been in the pharmaceutical industry for over 25 years. Tell me some of the good. Tell me some of the bad and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> um, the large pharma industry, I think, has finally realized that they do early-stage drug development. Poorly, mm -hmm. they are sales and marketing machines. So just imagine what it is. Things are driven by sales and marketing. Right. Now, my hope is that we can utilize that muscle to get the drug out to the most people. Yeah. But prior to that, you've got to do it on your own. Uh, the other thing is because it's sales and marketing, it's driven by pricing. And everyone knows and is sensitive and should be very sensitive to drug pricing. I think other countries in the world have started to deal with the United States is very, very slow. Yeah. We can't go down this path forever. Yeah. So what does Genspera do differently from the big pharma? The fun part and the best part is that we can be adept, agile, make decisions very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what large farmers tend not to do. We can take the risks that they will not take. Uh, what we have to do the same is all the regulatory components. We deal with the FDA, we're publicly traded, so we deal with SEC and FINRA. And because you're a small company, you actually have to do it better than large pharma because you get such scrutiny. Yeah. So when you're a transparent company like we are, we, there are certain rules in this game you have to abide by, but the creativity is so much more uh, releasing than you'd get in a large pharma organization. Yeah. So, Craig, what's the hardest part of your job? Because this is, you have a lot of moving parts here. It's like a, it's a business, but it's also lots of research that goes behind a lot of regulations. What's the, what's the toughest part? The toughest part of my role is not what you just described. Yeah. That's, you know, hard enough, but that's what we do. You know, right, that's right. The harder part of being the CEO is keeping the investors and the shareholders with the long-term view of what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't get results in two or three weeks like you might in other industries. Right. It takes a while to do that, and it takes discipline, it takes patience, and you only have one chance to do it right. Yeah. So how do you communicate that to keep everyone on the same page? 
there's a there's a lot of telephone conversations, a lot of visits, you know, when I'm in different cities, sitting down with the shareholders, giving them that sense that progress is being made, even though we don't have a press release every two weeks. Yeah. You know, there's, there's more data coming. We're at the stage where it's open uh, uh, label clinical studies. So I know every patient's getting drug and you know when the drug is working and sharing those studies or those stories and letting them know that we're on the path. The drug is working. Not for everybody, but it's going to make a big, big difference for a lot of patients. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you brought up pricing. I have uh, a question I was going to ask later, but, you know, I was thinking about it and I was reading your blog post on your site about pricing. And so how do you price something? How do you price you something know? that saves, I mean, it's saving people's lives, but on the same sense, you need to generate a profit so that you can stay in business to generate more life-saving drugs. That I could almost leave to the discretion of large pharma who will eventually sell our drugs. You'd like to take advantage, I say, of the muscle of large pharma, that mm -hmm. sales distribution, get the drug out to as much as many patients as possible. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you can charge an arm and a leg. You know, they're very, because somehow you'll get more patients by charging less amount of, of dollars per, per dose. Yeah. I think it's a balance. Um, we don't have to face that, that balance ourselves right now, um, but there's a lot of cutthroat to that question. Is there um, a, a drug that you can point to that you think did it really well with pricing out there or made a big mistake with the pricing? Uh, Dendrion's vaccine was a huge mistake. I what was? That Dendrion's vaccine okay. uh, for prostate cancer. Um Part of it was the pricing, part of it was the difficulty in marketing and asking for doctors essentially to front the cost before the patients mm -hmm. would pay and receive any benefit. Um, that I think is a classic example. I hate to pick on any company, but I think people would realize that that failed. Mm -hmm. Others are just extraordinarily high and yeah. they're trying to recoup costs. Uh, the argument from pharma will be appropriately that Good medicines take patients out of hospitals, and drugs are only ten percent of the total cost. I got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. Easy to point at that, and point a finger at that as being outrageous when it's a whole healthcare system that needs to be reevaluated. Yeah. So the argument is, it it takes someone out of the hospital. Their overnight stay may be tens of thousands of dollars. What's the so? What if it's a little bit more expensive? Type of thing. So, and what we do, uh, and you see a lot of pressure on companies, us in particular, uh, in our future studies, there will be pharmacoeconomics. What's the total cost savings by being on our drug yeah. or another drug with, uh, let's say, supportive care that has to come in and involve the total cost to the patient uh, so that we can quantify it so I it's see. a little bit more transparent where the pricing comes from. I see. Yeah, you figure it all in there. That makes sense. And you mentioned, too, partnerships are huge. Right. So how do you even do you broach that now? Um, and then what do you do going forward with distributing the, the drug and, and selling it? You know, this is we are all as any CEO is we're constantly involved with other in discussions with other companies, yeah. uh, both for us to acquire or for us to be acquired or we license. What you really want to do is find the right partner at the right time where it gives the greatest value to shareholders. Yeah. The last thing I want to do is hand our drug off to a large pharma partner too soon and they're too slow to develop it so right. that we don't and the patients don't benefit. Right. Right. So it, it's you know, it's a dance it's we a, all play, but it's a continuous discussion. Yeah. It's a tough job you have because it's such a long term vision. You know, it's not like, oh, we can we're looking a year out. How long are we do we have to look out? before you could start actually, you know, getting this out to the public? Probably in the, if things went really well in the next three to four years, the, but what happens in this process, it's long, it's really hard at the beginning when you have so many non-believers. Now we have data, not just in animals, but in patients that the drug is working. So it gets de-risked as you move it further along, it becomes more and more a reality. Um, the challenge now is to find who are those patients who are going to respond the best? Yeah. Uh, but that's the whole beauty of personalized medicine is that we're only going to take this drug to the patient that we think will benefit. Uh, and that decreases total health care costs as well. But that's also the really, really fun part. Yeah. Craig, so what do the non-believers and skeptic, 
skeptics ask? What are the most common questions that they ask? You know, the first, uh, before we got into patients, it was, it's never going to work because it's a pro drug. You know, it's, it's a, it's a very toxic molecule with, uh, an attachment. I say like a low molecular grenade, a bomb and a grenade pin. Right. And it's safe as long as the grenade pin is attached and the tumor pulls a grenade pin. It works fine. But yeah. if it falls apart elsewhere, that's the danger. No one thought we'd get there. Well, we have, and human data show the drug is very, very safe and well tolerated. Now the skeptics are, is it a big enough market? Uh, you're in orphan drug diseases, you know, liver cancer in the U.S., glioblastoma in the U.S., or orphan products. Will there be enough money? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's being overcome pretty well. But where we are now is the key opinion leaders, the experts in these areas are calling us, asking to participate in the trial. And it's not us knocking on the door, it's them calling us. And that is a fantastic feeling because the word's getting out through the medical community. Yeah. It's so funny, not funny really, but that people see it in that light, a big enough market, right? When I hear that, it's there's two prongs to that. Obviously, it's, well, it's saving lives. Like if someone has liver cancer, even though, because I heard you gave a talk at some symposium about this and you addressed this. Um, that liver cancer is not one of the number one killer or number four killer or something like that you said, but in the same time, like who cares in a sense, how big or small, like it's, there's people with liver cancer, right? And they need this therapy. So how do you balance that? This is a business and this, even if it's a small market, it's still saving lives. You know, we, there are whole companies based upon orphan indication. Yeah. So there's money to be made sometimes by just overpricing it or pricing it high so that there's a rationale for it. Mm -hmm. If you're a larger pharma uh, company, though, you say this trial is going to take 500 patients and it's only going to address 10,000 in the United States each year or a trial of 500 patients is going to get 20-fold more, they're going to put their money where they get 20-fold more. Right. And that is unfortunate. That's just economics, you know, of how to do it. Yeah. So we, we have to be bright, clever, what we have, some of our trials are being paid for by the investigator. You know, there's that level of enthusiasm and support that the team, again, it goes back to the concept of people want to be involved with it. Yeah. And that's, that's we're going to get it done. Yeah. And, you know, the trials, right? So how, do you, how hard is it to get into these hospitals and which hospitals um, are you in? I know there's, I think University of Wisconsin is one of them, right? Yeah, so our phase one study was at University of Wisconsin, Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. and UT Health Science Center in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. But for the trials, um, they're relatively small right now. So we're, if we're glioblastoma at the University of California, San Diego, and we're going to expand very shortly. Uh, the liver cancer studies were all done in Texas mm -hmm. because of the way we had support for the program. Yeah. Uh, but Patients, if they meet the eligibility requirements and can travel to the site, they should be able to get in. Yeah. What's the process of actually getting this into the hospital for clinical trials? That's a highly regulated process. Yeah. So uh, first off, we have uh, uh, an IND open with the Food and Drug Administration investigation on new drugs. So that's all cleared by the FDA. Right. And then for any hospital we want to work with, their institutional review board has to approve the protocol. They review all the safety data, what the protocol looks like. And once that's approved, then we can open the study. And of course, we have to work out contracts and who pays for whom. Um, but then it's open for the patient. So how do they get the word out to these patients that you know you need to get on this clinical trial that could potentially, like someone who's in dire straits? You know, so for the patient, first off, they should go to clinicaltrials.gov. Mm. There's a list of all ongoing clinical trials in the U.S. Okay. and most ones around the world as well. So that's the, the patient resource. The patient should be demanding of his doctor or her doctor, help me out here. Go okay. find this. And I just had this conversation yesterday. Yeah. A patient's not getting the help. They have to take advantage of the Internet, the website. But yeah. clinicaltrials.gov is a good, good place for yeah. them to start. However, trials sometimes have trouble enrollment, and it's on television, radio, the whole business advertising to get patients. What was the conversation that you had? Um, a friend's 
uh, mother has uh, lung cancer that's metastasized wow. and has gone through the first chemotherapies, what's available? Right. And from what I heard, they weren't talking about the things that were just approved even this week. Right. So there's some new immunotherapies, so there's some new kinase inhibitors. In the last few years, a lot's happened for lung cancer patients. Mm. So uh, I will later today send an email with the, here's a list as to what she should be asking right. for. And your friend knows you're the expert and just contacted you and then you were giving him this advice? I get too many of these, but you yes, can, yeah. <laughs> this too. Yeah. But you always help out the, the individuals that yeah. you can. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I want to talk about some of the mechanisms behind it because it's very interesting. Um, so I want you to start, talk about the significance of Dr. Isaacs and Dr. Christensen a little bit. Okay, so the, the Dr. Isaacs has long been an expert in prostate cancer at Johns Hopkins University. Yeah. Uh, prostate cancer is a very slow-growing tumor. And so the question back, you know, we know chemotherapy doesn't work. Standard chemotherapy that kills dividing cells doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So he really postulated the idea and showed the data that we have to be able to kill these cells when they're not dividing. Then he learned of Dr. Christensen's work with the molecule Fapsigargan right. that is a hundredfold more potent than other chemotherapeutic agents and kills independently of cell division. So they started a scientific collaboration from Hopkins and the University of Copenhagen right. to develop this drug and Sam Denby joined that as well. And so it's, a, it's another part of the teamwork and collaboration that it was their idea to create these low molecular grenades so that you could target this toxin directly to the tumor. So those are the key guys, and I speak with them routinely. Yeah, they are very enthusiastic about the data. Yeah, and Dr. Christensen is the one who originally was he the originally one who kind of isolated the root. It was like the root of Thapsia garganica plant. Is that Thapsia garganica plant, which is part of the carrot family? It's a poisonous weed that grows throughout the Mediterranean. Uh, it's been used since the ancient Greeks in all sorts of folk medicine. Yeah, uh, what do they use it for? Uh, they made teas to induce abortion as a purgative. Really? Clean you out from both ends. Up until the 1930s, they were making plasters from the root uh, to put on the skin as a counter irritant. Hmm. So, I mean, this has been used forever. Dr. Christensen is just a natural product chemist who is curious to know how it works. And he isolated the active ingredient and showed the chemical structure of molecular mechanism of action. Since then, they are over 7,500 scientific papers published in the National Library of Medicine. So that all originated from Soren's work. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, I think the video on Gensparo talks about how camels would eat it and they'd die from it. Yeah, and sheep don't eat it, so we figure sheep have bigger brains. <laughs> so it's like, how did he come to, well, camels eat it and die, we should do something with it? You know, well, the Greeks have been using Theophrastus wrote about it. The plant was so economically important that its image was stamped on Cyrenian coins from the Roman time. Hmm. So people found a way to harvest that in some sort of medical way. Uh, but once you have the purified Thapsigargan, it is extraordinarily toxic. Yeah. Um, but then, again, this is just the outcome of his work. But when we talked about how do you get a big idea, Think in a big picture way with right. a blank sheet of paper. Right. That's the John Isaac, Sam Denby, Soren Christensen collaboration that this came about from. Yeah. You know, and Craig, there's tons of research out there, scientists doing various research. What made you zero in on both of them? And th you knew this was the key to what you wanted to do? Well, I was very, very lucky because when I went to Cephalon as a neuroscience company, yeah. nobody there knew anything about oncology. So when I brought Cephalon into oncology, I did it out of house. John Isaacs was the world's expert in prostate cancer, so mm -hmm. I worked with him with my prostate cancer ideas. Mm -hmm. So I've been working with John since 1993 continuously. This stuff developed in their lab. Obviously, I was familiar with it and trusted them. So in 2003, we formed Gen Spera to take advantage of their technology. So I saw it happening, and I knew the quality of the work. Yeah, and at the time, it was obviously it's been more developed now. What was it like then, what they're developing, and then what is it like now that you have? Night and day. <laughs> Night and day. Yeah. 
there were many fewer believers back then. You know, this was high risk. Um, as I told you, I brought it to Cephalon and all the other vice presidents said it'll never work. But that was just pages of, okay, these are issues we solve. If you're willing to work hard and you believe in it, you solve it. The real difference between then and now is human data. This drug works in certain patients yeah. and dramatically. And that is completely, I would say, awe-inspiring and also presents tremendous personal responsibility on us the team that we've got to get this to patients as fast as possible yeah you know craig what's interesting is i'm just curious what made you so sure at the time there were skeptics people didn't believe it and you somehow had you saw it and you had a vision that knowing probably that maybe you this is a long haul maybe you won't be taking a paycheck because it's going to take not only convincing people but developing it what did you see early on that you knew this was what you needed to spend the rest of the, of the you know decade, two decades, three decades working on? Um, this answer, remember, I'd also developed other drugs that went into man into clinical trials yeah. um, that had certain limitations. This approach, if it worked, would overcome those limitations. Yeah. What did you see? So, what were the limitations? Uh, drug resistance, uh, kinase inhibitors in particular, will work for a while and then they quit working. Um, most chemotherapy will work for a while and then quit working. You can't get resistance to this drug. So that's one key, key feature. It should continue to work. Also, this should be curative in certain patients, and I think it's done that for certain patients, um, by its mechanism of action. The other approach, this is so completely different than anything else. I didn't do it because it's different. I did it because I believe the approach is better. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even the name itself, Mipsigargin, has a new stem associated with it, which means the nomenclature committee, the, the American Medical Association and World Health Organization that give names or generic names to drugs. We have a completely new stem that means that unlike anything else, <clears throat> in either molecular mechanism of action or by chemical structure. But it was just, I think, the beauty of the science, the rationale that says you have to try this. There's no guarantee it was ever going to work. So how'd you come up with the name? Well, Mipsigargan is the name, right? What What is that and why why that? I'm thinking, just call it like cancer grenade or something. I would have liked to call it cancer grenade. Explain <laughs> uh, the nomenclature committee. These are, these are doctors that, uh, like I said, World Health Organization, American Medical Association, they give us guidelines to make suggestions and then I think they just ignore everything you suggested. So they... So this was a surprise. So they you give them suggestions, they just come up with it? They, they, spent... yeah, more or less. Really? Yeah, and I don't want to go into it, but they broke their own rules in the way we got this name. <laughs> but what I fought for and what we did get was a novel sound, which is Gargin. Yeah. Which is because it's unlike anything else, that's a differentiation factor. Even the name says this is unlike everything else. So that when you get to pricing and reimbursement, you start with this is different. Right. Because and that's the derivative of the plant. Is that why? And that's not typical. I'm sure that's why they came up with it. Yeah. That's all we we have no idea. Right. So what is that mo what is that compound, Mipsigargan? Mipsigargan is like I say, a molecular grenade. It's a bomb and a grenade pen. Yeah. The bomb part is derived from this very potent toxin, Pastigargan, mm -hmm. that's a hundredfold more potent than other chemotherapeutic agents. And the grenade pen is a peptide that's designed to be specifically recognized and then removed by a protein that resides only within the tumor, okay? And that protein is called PSMA. It's in the blood vessels of all solid tumors, all different tumor types. So as we infuse the drug into the bloodstream, it's safe, it doesn't do anything. Until it gets into the tumor, the tumor pulls a grenade in, mm -hmm. the bomb is released, it falls into the tumor and doesn't come into the bloodstream to cause toxicity elsewhere in the body. And it really does work this way. That's why we have such minimal toxicity with the drug, despite putting this unbelievable poison in the body. Yeah. So what point, what, uh, Craig, do you feel, what does it work on? Certain types of cancers that work on and certain types that it doesn't work on? Well, obviously, since we're targeting the enzyme or the protein PSMA, those that have a lot of PSMA, yeah. those happen to be tumors with lots of blood vessels. Yeah. Liver cancer, which is the fifth largest tumor worldwide, third largest cancer killer worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, glioblastoma, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. which is an orphan indication here in the U.S. with about 10,000 patients, but it's a terrible, terrible disease. But what we feel that once we show it works in that brain tumor, we should be able to show that it works in other tumors that metastasize the brain, like mm -hmm. breast lung cancer, where there's hundreds of thousands of patients each year in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So, but the, the tumor types go on and on. Prostate cancer we're looking at. We have protocols for kidney cancer, various types of kidney cancer. We think it's going to be useful across a wide, wide range of tumor types. Yeah. So talk about some of the clinical trials. Phase one, and I think, uh, what phases are some of them in now? So, yes, uh, typical clinical trials, you start in phase one with, in cancer drugs with patients who failed all available therapies. Yeah. And what you're looking for, you dose escalate across a number of patients to find what is the maximum tolerated dose. You're really looking at safety. Um, phase see. two is when you take it into a specific tumor type, like we did in liver cancer, and you're looking to get signals of efficacy. So we did, we completed a phase two liver cancer study in about 25 patients, yeah. and we got really remarkable results. We have some patients Normally, these patients have all taken Nexavar. They've failed or progressed on Nexavar, meaning the tumors are growing. Yeah. When they come onto clinical trials to test experimental drugs, they usually only last two months until they're progressed. Really? Our primary endpoint was 4.5 months uh, for tumor progression, so it's a much larger number. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, about 30% of those patients were five months to a year on the drug before the tumors were shown to grow. Mm -hmm. Other patients, about 25-30% of patients, the tumors never grew again, but the patients got clinically worse because they're dying of liver disease in addition to liver cancer. Right. So but that was very, and what we demonstrated in that study, that the drug is on board at a safe dose and absolutely destroying the tumors. We could actually quantify the blood flow within tumors and show that that's just been mm -hmm. decimated. Okay, so these are tumors that have disappeared. Yeah. So that I mean that was critical. In the phase two, we have a we have a phase two glioblastoma study ongoing. Mm -hmm. Presented data for the first time a few weeks ago. We've got some patients that really experience clinical benefit. Very clearly, the tumors are shrinking. The edema that's associated with the disease, the swelling uh, in the brain that causes so much uh, painful headache, is gone. Mm -hmm. uh, less. Steroid use, we've got one patient now at nine months when they usually only last two months, and he's doing fine. You mean we have a they have a two-month, the they last two months, like it's a death sentence after two months? Is that well, that's when you know the tumors are growing. The, usually it's about 10 months till overall survival, wow. but by two months you know that they're already progressing. Wow. So we've got, you know, by two months if the tumors are growing and they come off steady. Ours are going out longer than that. And so this... We have all these keys that show, the, for instance, we have a liver cancer patient now three years since coming on our study, that whose tumors were growing. So obviously, I think he's cured. Yeah. Another patient in the, in the liver cancer study with a spinal column metastasis, severe bone pain in a wheelchair. After three months, there's no more bone pain, there's no more wheelchair, and he's walking in to get his drug. So those are, although anecdotal, small patient numbers, the drug is working at this dose. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly the same dosing regimen that we use in the glioblastoma study that we use in the liver cancer study. So the data cross corroborate each other, which gives us a lot more confidence that in our future studies, we're going to see similar things in other tumor types. Yeah. So what's the most remarkable result, Craig, from the phase one that you've seen? That one patient who's out three years and still kicking. Yeah. You know, that's, he was on the one approved drug for three months, and his tumors grew right through that, came on our study, and now it's been three years and tumors haven't grown at all. We took him off drug about six months ago because he was tired of traveling to get the drug. He's doing fine. What, what kind of cancer was it? That was a liver cancer patient. That was a liver cancer. And then what about your, the most remarkable phase two? Well, the phase two, we've had the, the patient with the pain go away and, yeah. and get rid of the wheelchairs. Um, and as I got to tell you, this glioblastoma patient, that nine months and counting, he's he's doing fine. His cognitive does. I had no side effect whatsoever mm. on this drug. So it's finding what, and the other thing important in the glioblastoma study, not everybody responds to drugs, but what it's starting to look like is 
we can always get a tumor specimen from these patients and, and screen for PSMA. And it's those with the highest PSMA that respond, and those with no PSMA or very low levels do not. So that's a tumor marker that allows us to enrich for the PSMA staining patients in future studies. So this is really the, what you hear about personalized medicine that will be able to target our drugs specifically to the uh, patients who are likely to respond. Yeah. What's that's the best, a very exciting time. Yeah, that's amazing. What's the best method to measure it? For PSMA right now, it's actually having a tumor specimen that you stain with an antibody via immunohistochemistry. But this is standard pathology, you know, type mm. uh, services that you have at every hospital. Yeah. Is imaging used too, or is it mostly just... Less so. There are some approaches to use PSMA imaging. Um None of them are, well, one's approved and only for prostate cancer because it's not very, very good. There are some exciting ones that are in the development stage that perhaps in a few years will be using that to actually enrich the patient, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah. So those are, does that look like an MRI type of images? Correct. Okay. And imaging, positron emission tomography. Yeah. So what's some of the next steps now that you've seen positive results, the side effects are minimal? You know, every probably cancer patient or their family is like, okay, like cut to the chase. Like, let's just try this. You know, what, what's next? What do you have to do uh, next? Liver cancer studies, uh, where we are focused on East Asia, where there are the bulk of the patients. Yeah. And we can move it much, much earlier in the disease. Mm. Uh, so rather than failing liver cancer patients, let's move it up where you're doing local therapy. And there are a lot more patients that so we can generate data a lot more quickly. Mm -hmm. That's We're designing those studies now. The glioblastoma studies, we're midway through the phase two, I think in the first quarter next year, we'll have sufficient information to start designing a much larger trial, which will be many more sites and probably global. Uh, but we're pretty excited about that because the data, not just with PSMA, but we're looking at some other biomarkers with a grant actually from the FDA paying for all this, hmm. which is really nice. Um, we think there will be some other biomarkers, so we really can hone in on those patients most uh, able to benefit from the drug. So obviously, that narrows your patient population. It makes enrollment a little bit slower, but you need many fewer patients if your drug's working in most of them. Yeah. So that's that we will design over the next few months. So how do you move past clinical trials and into the masses? Well, you need to have a what we call a registration study done where obviously uh, – a double-blind study, sometimes placebo, just sometimes it's best standard of care, uh, plus our drug. Those we hope to put into the next study design, but that's always in discussion with the regulatory agencies like the FDA, mm -hmm. and it's pre-agreed that if you get certain data, then the drug will be approvable. So now you have to go through that whole process, but we have a very good relationship with the FDA, and I'm encouraged by our chance. Yeah. So obviously... Oh, Craig, there's a lot of positives here. What what have been some of the hurdles, biggest hurdles and challenges to get to this point? Um, honestly, the biggest one is getting enough money to keep it moving fast. You know, we're a small biotech company. We're on the bulletin board. Uh, the investment community, you know, for various reasons, don't want to invest in these small companies like us. So it's really getting that next level of financing. And I think that's it. The acceleration, the desire is there. And we'll expand a lot next year. Yeah. What's, what's, how much investment is needed to, to take this on? We'll spend about 12 million bucks a year over the next few years um, to get these studies underway and running all the way through. Once we get a little bit more data, our interim data on those, we'll know how big the studies need to be. But these trials are expensive. They can cost sixty-five to hundred thousand dollars per patient. Wow! Seriously, so, so, holy yeah, cow! You start talking about hundreds of patients. It's a little bit there, and then we're an orphan indication, so that means fewer patients to, to pull from. But the advantage we have is the medical community jumps on the train real fast when they yeah. see data coming in. So we've had, like I mentioned earlier, we're getting the phone calls, we're getting the emails. Hey, I'd really like to participate in your study. And these are from some really big names in the field. So that the key opinion leaders are coming on board without us having to knock on the door. Yeah. 
So do patients ever fund that or is it strictly f- these the trials are funded from the company only? Like let's say a patient comes and go, I want to be on this. Can they actually pay their way to do it or, or is uh, we that- do get those requests and the answer is no, we don't really do that. You know, the, usually the company pays or the sponsor might be the institution where it's an investigator initiated study. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's the multiple myeloma foundation, for instance, funded a number of studies. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, waiting for the philanthropy to come in is a slow process. I think it's, I believe in capitalist system. I believe in the venture monies and the investor monies. Yeah. And I think the investor community is going to come in and we'll yeah. be able to, but that's the fastest way. Yeah. And so what about some of the challenges with the science? Because it, you didn't, it wasn't probably like a straight path from where you were in the beginning to what you are now. What were some of the big milestones along the way from the science perspective? You know, that's uh, first off, um, as I mentioned, nobody believed the drug would be safe. Yeah. Science in the animal models, you know, before we brought it and started putting a lot of money into development, was all done at Johns Hopkins with, oh, $15 million worth of research funds from various funding agencies. Yeah. So the science, the animal models were very, very clean. What was... There are two big hurdles you think of next is chemistry manufacturing control. Can we make the drug? Yeah. Is it stable? We have seven years stability on drug product in the vial. It's unbelievably good. Very straightforward chemistry. The second hurdle was toxicology. Once we take it into animals and really look for tox, um, can it move forward? And that surprised everybody, including our experts. Much, much safer drug than we ever thought. So that's just... Can we go to man? The FDA was very, very easy. We got through them in 40 days with one round of questions and answers. And then the the question is, does it work in man? Can you give enough drug under the right conditions and show it work? That's what we did in the last year. So now the challenge is, I mean, you know it works. Now it's identify the right patient. And And the most effective trial design to get this to the patients as rapidly as possible. Yeah. So you think there was such a linear path of success because there was so much research done at John Hopkins and, and previous? I think that was a large part of it. The other part is the team that we assembled. You know, we've all done this before. And as I mentioned, you don't get second chances in this industry. So although it may seem slow at times, it was done correctly. Mm-hmm. And that's very, very important. It's a highly regulatory, regulated business. You want good relations with the FDA. They don't want to see any sloppy stuff. We don't want to see sloppy stuff. But I think the most important thing is that the team that we assemble. Yeah. There's a lot of experts associated yeah. with that. Yeah. So, Craig, tell me, who are the key, some of the key team members and what you feel their biggest contribution or milestone is within you the You know, company? they come on at, at different times. Yeah. Uh, one... Well, two, I'll talk about manufacturing. Fapsibita is a company in Spain from which we buy all the the Fapsia Garganica seeds. Mm. We've been working with them since 2004. Great partnership. They do the cultivation and harvest. Uh, We just announced a deal with Phyton Biotech earlier this year, which are working. They are the world's premier plant cell fermentation company where they're taking Fapsia Garganica generating single-cell cultures that we can then ferment to isolate Fapsigargan, and that's moving along very, very well. Uh, Just world-class operation. Uh, On the individual basis, the physicians with whom we work, Dr. Santosh Kayseri at University of California, San Diego, now at the John Wayne Cancer Center, uh, the Balingam Mahalingam here in San Antonio. These are really dedicated, very bright clinical researchers who... You know, we're following their lead. It's their baby now, as I talked about. Yeah, and what about, because I noticed on your site, you have a lot of board and managers, and um, can you talk about the scientific advisory board, too? Well, the scientific advisory board is uh, John Isaac, Sam Denmead, Soren, Christian, uh, Soren Christensen, who are the co-inventors of the technology. Right. But we still have regular dialogue. They are involved. At, there's a lot of other ideas they have that mm-hmm. we may bring into the company. But, you know, our board of directors are critical. Uh, Soren Christian, I mean, uh, Bo Jesper Hansen has a ton of experience and was brought on board because of his merger and acquisition experience. Mm. And 
think he's done 63 drugs that he sells now through Swedish Orphan BioVitrum in Europe. And Peter Grebo was on the executive committee at Cephalon for years, knows everything about drug development process. It's tremendous depth and expertise there. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, anyone, no matter what industry, you really need to build a, a great team, you know, whatever it is. So what what does it take you? How have you created this dream team of people? Well, you know, this is we run a virtual company, which means different things to different people. We yeah. have two full-time employees, which yeah. seems crazy for all we do, but we rely upon consultants. And because we do that, it allows me to access the best talent anywhere in the world on a moment's notice. Yeah. That is that is key. I only pay for them when I need them, and they're available, but they only come on board because they want to. So it's that level of enthusiasm that it's a, sometimes it's a fluctuating team uh, because we need different skills at different points in time, but it's their dedication. And when we started this conversation, how do you build a team where everybody feels like they're the most important member? Right. You know, we get that. And then they bring their friends and, and expertise as well. Yeah. And Craig, at the, the beginning of the interview, we were talking about what we want to make sure we talk about. And one thing was talking about last year was critical. Oh, it's unbelievable. We need to talk about, you know, how long and hard it is to get here, but to have clinical data come in that are convincing that the drug is working. That changes everything. That that, that means renewed enthusiasm with everybody, mm -hmm. uh, renewed investor confidence, but also the ability to say, okay, we've done this once, we can go back and do it again. Mm -hmm. We have other molecules in our pipeline that we can go access. There are other ways to use Fabsigargan. Now that we've shown that you can deliver it to a patient safely yeah. and get efficacy, there are many, many other ways that we can use Fabsigargan. So that also sets us up for all the different potential partners that want to use it in different ways or for different clinical endpoints or different you know, types of, of cancers. So it's opened up our business development as well. How do you test delivery, the best way to deliver it? Well, the best thing to see tumors to go away. That's a good. That's a good yeah. sign. See, I mean, deliver the actual genetics. into a patient, like delivery wise. Is there like a is that a typical standard, or does everyone deliver this type of treatment the same way? Uh, well, we deliver this drug via an IV infusion mm -hmm. over about an hour long period, mm -hmm. and we do that over three consecutive days. And the mm -hmm. reason we do it via IV yeah. is because the grenade pin, the peptide probably would not be stable if we tried to administer it orally. So this is how we bypass all that degradation, just get it to the patient the first time. Mm -hmm. We've also developed another form of the drug, which is a nano emulsion, which is an injectable form of the drug. So mm -hmm. instead of sitting there with an IV bag for an hour, it'll be about a two minute injection. So obviously it's much better for patients. Is that like th into uh, the muscle or where does it get injected? No, it will be injected the way we envision it. It will be injected into the bloodstream, into a vein. I got you. Um, but it's so much easier for everything. The other important thing we haven't spoken about is what that does for our intellectual property, for yeah. our patent position. Yeah. So we have a really good intellectual property position, but obviously that was on stuff developed by Hopkins and some things we've done. But this nano emulsion will give us worldwide coverage to 2033. So that is a massively long time in the marketplace uh, where you have that type of exclusivity. So what, tell me about the, talk about the nano emulsion. What is that exactly? A nano emulsion, you know what it is. Uh, an emulsion is a vinaigrette. You know, it's oil droplets suspended in water. Yeah. The nano emulsion means that those oil droplets are about 100 nanometers in size. So they're very, very small. We can sterile filter them. But they stay suspended. It never separates. Okay. Yeah. So it's a type of formulation. By the time we make it, it's got some certain excipients mixed together with the drug that's in those little oil droplets. We can then freeze dry it, hmm. store it. A year later, come back, shoot in water. The really? droplets are up to the same size. And we wow. just that. That's it's pretty really cool. cool, cool technology. Yeah. So what about the other patents you were involved in? What were those? Oh, in, in my career prior yeah. to is there all what those? Were the, uh, yeah. Most of those go back to my days at uh, Rome Palenque Roar and Cephalon, where they dealt with uh, types of molecules called kinase inhibitors. Okay. So that was much of my background. And uh, 
And then not only that, but the things that I was the first to clone, some of the growth factor receptors, some tyrosine kinases. And uh, that was my earlier years of signal transduction expert. What should people know, Craig, about, you know, I was looking in your site and there's a link with, you know, genspera.com backslash product pipeline. And I was looking at the timeline and, you know, the blood vessels of most solid tumors. What's important uh, for people to note or for myself on that timeline um, of the product pop pipeline? It, I, I don't know exactly what you're looking at it's, right um, now. It shows like, I think the, the liver, uh, the liver cancer, and then it says 25 patients treated in, in phase two study at five sites. And then uh, it says 2015 partner outreach and then JBM, 15 patients treated, and then PCA, and then RCC. Um, what's important that we haven't talked about with, with You know, that? I think we, we've covered much. What um, things change when you get data. Yeah. And the liver cancer stuff, we're, we're intent on pushing forward. But the glioblastoma data are really impressive. Yeah. And the fact that we might be able to enrich only for those patients yeah. means that, and especially with the quality of the data, meaning showing tumors going away or shrinking at mm. least, um, we, we really want to accelerate that study. So that's, that's going to be a renewed emphasis. What we've actually done is put the prostate cancer study on hold because I want to divert any funds from that into glioblastoma. Yeah. Uh, and just, as I say, accelerate it. You know, this is when you, you want to get to the market as, as fast as possible. Right. So that what will happen is with any organization, you'll get off label use of your drug. So the patients will be getting access outside of clinical trials. If it's approved in one indication, that's our fastest path to approval probably is through GBM. Yeah. Any other things that you could think of, you know, about last year being critical? Any other points? That I think is, you know, signing the Python biotech deal primarily because of the data we've seen with them on their manufacturing. We believe they will be successful. Mm -hmm. All of those are little bits and pieces that even independently of our intellectual property, uh, with Python Biotech having a cell line derived Bapsigargan in our supply chain yeah. uh, makes generic competition much, much harder. Yeah. So forget patents. That just that know how will yeah. make things harder for any generic. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the other question is what's the fear of competition or is there not a fear and there's more of a collaboration approach? What's the mentality in the, in the scientific community? You know, uh, independent of generic competition, let's just talk about other drugs that are in the clinic. Yeah. My view is perhaps a little different than other CEOs. Yeah. I absolutely want every drug to get approved. When you take a loved one to the emergency room or the hospital, you don't care what company's name is on the label. You know that that's how you I don't even know what company's name is on the label, probably. You, well, yeah. I do some of them. You do, but, yeah. I'm sure. But the the patients, you know, don't and but, yeah. you know so. I want those drugs to get approved. But one thing to keep in mind, even with all the new things you hear about immunotherapies, which is really exciting, it may only work in 19% of patients or 25% mm -hmm. of patients. No one drug is going to work on every patient. And so what we all have to do as an industry is try to identify which patients will best respond to our drug and then what are the combination studies. So for instance, our drug where the mentioned minimal side effect, what is really important is what it doesn't do. It doesn't affect the heart, it doesn't affect the liver, and most importantly, it has no effect on bone marrow. So there will be no immunosuppression. Hmm. But you can combine my drug with any immunotherapy, which will only make the immunotherapy better because you need those white blood cells for yeah. a strong immune system. Those are the challenges that we're going to see over the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah. So when I look at it, you know, when you say collaboration or is it competition, right. we're going to be partners, you know, eventually when all the drugs work. Yeah. And then so the other part I wanted to talk about with you is about lessons. So we had talked about before, not just lessons, mistakes that you learned from <clears throat> yourself, but also, talk about mistakes that you learned from other people so you, did, so you avoided them. You know, this, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because we all make our own mistakes and 
you, hopefully you learn and don't do the same thing twice. But in anybody's career, people around you are making mistakes both in their career and their personal life. You don't want to do it. I had, I don't even want to mention names, but he just loved little white lies. It was a sense of power, you know, and if you're a scientist, there's no such thing as a little white lie. It's either true or false or, mm -hmm. you know, you will be found out. But it's just like your mother told you, it will snowball and snowball because then it gets bigger and bigger. And then suddenly you've got a cover up that's unimaginable. If you just told the truth, you wouldn't have it. But other things that I think were important in career development, I was never afraid to take the next step and learn what it needed to do to have a drug. And I've had a real dear friend whose career was essentially halted because she didn't want to, she was great at drug discovery, but didn't want to do the more quote mundane things like drug formulation or manufacturing. And so it held her back because somebody's got to lead that entire team, mm. you know, and she chose not to do that. And for me, it, look, someone's got to lead. Usually it's me, you know, so, but that means you need to learn the formulation aspect. Why do you think she didn't want to? It's a comfort understand. level that everybody has, scientists in particular. Yeah. You become expert, if you, you're trained as a scientist to become expert, yeah. be knowledgeable in an area. But then to move away from that and start from scratch again, you don't know so much. You're not comfortable. You don't have the prestige. You've got to earn that respect all over again. People don't want to do that, especially scientists. I do it all the time. And I think the real advantage is that you learn everything from each experience. If you're expert in A, then you go to B, you become expert in B, and now you're twice as valuable to your team and everybody else. Yeah. So, Craig, how did you decide... When you are going to introduce into humans, you know you have there's limited resources. You want to make target the the most likely. It, this reminds me because you said the white lie. Like everyone on the team wants it to succeed so badly, and how do you decide what type of patient to administer it to when you haven't tested it on patients yet? So you know you want to get that positive outcome. You know for the drug. <coughs> you know. Well, that's a, that's a good question. And then there's two um, aspects of it. One that I get asked, you know, how cynical should we be about doctors or whatever? In oncology, quite often, if a drug like ours may be used for across different tumor types, you're all different tumor types. Right. You know, but these are phase one patients who failed everything and they're unlikely to benefit from anything. And you dose escalate until you get, okay, now here's the dose we want to use. Right. And then you enrich for subsets of patients that might respond, like liver cancer. Yeah. And we enrich for 16 patients, of which yeah. five were liver cancer. Yeah. We got great data in two. Yeah. Okay, so we get driven by data. Yeah. That opened up the doors to really say... I mean, how did you know to even start with the liver patients? Oh, but that, that goes back to just basic science. So... We knew this started as a prostate cancer program because prostate cancer cells make PSMA, prostate-specific membrane antigen. Yeah, yeah. But then other scientists, just trying to make reagents like antibodies, uh, serendipitously found out that PSMA is also in all the other tumor types. Well, in liver cancer, they have lots of blood vessels, and they make a lot of PSMA relative to other tumor types like uh, mesothelioma that has very, very, very little PSMA expression. So that's how that got highlighted. And the same thing for glioblastoma, to make a lot of PSMA. Mm. What we were surprised to learn, as we just reported the data a few weeks ago, in glioblastoma, only about 60% of the patients have a lot of expression of PSMA. So now we mm. can target that, but it's driven by the science mm -hmm. that we were looking for. And to be honest, why do we do liver cancer? I wanted to work in San Antonio with Dr. Mahalingam and He's got the second largest liver cancer patient population in the world, and there were no data. So I requested from my colleagues at Hopkins, go get the data in liver cancer. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did, and it opened the door to do it. Yeah. So there's a lot of feedback all the way, as I say, collaboration, where you accept ideas and, and test the ideas. But then the data drives the process. Yeah. What about, what should people know about running a public company? <laughs> Think about it twice. <laughs> uh, there's, 
I don't mind the level of, of transparency or scrutiny that you get. Right. Uh, it's got its advantages and disadvantages. You right. can always raise money at a public company at some price. Mm -hmm. So that's what it boils down to. Right. And at some point, investors want exit. Well, if you're in a venture-backed company, when's your exit? When you have an IPO or it's an acquisition, and you're locked up. At least if you're a public company, if you have any degree of liquidity, an investor can get out for whatever reason. Right. And I think it allows you, as you go through the lifetime of a company, and you see this in our company, the types of investors you have, when they invest, when is their exit. And But now we're getting to much more expensive trials, so we need to access institutional funds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's that's being a publicly traded company, either on the bullet board or uplist in Nasdaq. Yeah, you know, Craig. Since it's inspired Insider, I always ask the question: What's been the lowest point, and then how you got through it? The lowest point might be what we talked a little bit about before. Right after I quit uh, Cephalon, started this company, and for three or four years had no money. You know, both for the company, so you doubt whether you made the right decision for your mm -hmm. family. Um, you know, you know what you're putting them through, and you know you got kids, you got special schools, you know, for things like that. But it, it was a part of the identity. So how do you get through it? Your family, you know, I got a great wife who's been married thirty something years. Right. Uh, the kids too were very, very proud that you know they like to be able to say, "My dad's going to cure cancer." Yeah. That was part of their identity. Right. So you'd have a bad day, and they'll ask, you know, well, what happened today? And you can't tell them the bad news. You got to tell them the good news. Right. You know? so right. They keep going. And then, of course, your colleagues, John Isaacs, you know, that that I had that was always encouraging. Keep your eye on the goal here. Yeah. Okay. And we did get through it all. Yeah. You know? And it, and it's really you look back and. You know, but you rely upon friends and family. Yeah. So what words of wisdom did your wife have when you were going through that? You knew it would be tough. You can do it. <laughs> We've been married a long time. You know, I'm pretty determined. And it's, uh, we were never driven by money. It's always driven by what are you trying to achieve? Yeah. And if you believe in it, you keep doing it. Yeah, because that is tough. You know, it's easier sometimes when someone gives that advice and when you're actually in the situation, you know, looking back now, but at the time it's got to be difficult. Like you go to, you know, Dr. Isaacs or your wife and say that, and that is the circumstance, you know. Well, let, let me, I, I agree with you, but what you have to then do is it wasn't a science issue. It was a funding business issue. Mm -hmm. So we needed to be, as imaginative in the business as yeah. we were in our science. Yeah. Typically in those times, which is 2004, you know, through first monies came in in 2007, right. the typical way to get money was through VC and VCs were abandoning early stage or early stage companies, you yeah. know, anything were preclinical, they weren't being touched. So what we did was go public on our own, file an S1, oh, well. a self, you know, registration, which very, very few companies had done by that point in time. Yeah. Okay, so it was a true, and again, credit the imagination of our corporate counsel, who I brought on board at that time to work through this process. He's been with us since then. He's a great securities counsel. But having that imagination through all aspects of your team, I think is another lesson that you have. Everybody's got to be good. Yeah. What was the most interesting experience going through the, Becoming a uh, public company. Man, you know, I've never done this before. So it's the level of regulation, the expectations of shareholders. It's one thing when you have VCs who are very sophisticated in your business and understand more or less what you're trying to do versus layperson investors who are interested, enthusiastic, but don't really know your business. Right. And accommodating all that, you know, and having to communicate at a level. These are bright people. Yeah. They're just not medicine people. Right. You know? It's a different language. Yeah. It's a different language. And then really becoming comfortable with speaking in that language. Yeah. So, Craig, on the flip side, what's been one of the proudest moments? I got to tell you, clinical data, <laughs> all the time, I'll point to that. That's when you know you were right. Yeah. 
you know, you can talk to your investors and you say it may have been more expensive, it may have been taken longer, but right. your money was well spent. Look what it's going to do for patients. And that that is real. Now, we still have a lot of business to do, obviously, but clinical data, you could always say, I yeah. told you so, you know, believe in me, we okay. got there. Right. We're not done yet, but it's now you get turning the crank and doing it aggressively. Yeah. What was the first piece of data that came in that you felt that? That first liver cancer patient who lasted a year was, you know, at, what you learn as you start learning more about particular cancers, no one says eight months in these patients. You know, it never happens. Mm. And, you know, you go, you, you talk to experts, you say, I don't want to fool myself. Do I believe the data? Right. And they'll say, you know, is this just an outlier? And they say, yeah, you'll get an outlier like that, one in 200, not two out of five. You got to go do the next study. And then when you take it to, we again, you don't want to drink your own Kool-Aid. We take our data to medical advisory panels, key opinion leaders from around the world and say, right. what do you think? You know, if you tell us, I don't want to waste time and money. Yeah. And they're constantly encouraging. You have something here. You have to go forward. And that's where you're hearing it. They're not getting anything personal out of this. It's just that we like the mechanism of action. The side effect profile is unbelievable. We think it works. Now we have the data that say we know it works for these patients. Let's just find out what's the best way. Yeah, Craig, this has been hugely valuable. And I've really enjoyed the the deep discussion on this. I have one last question for you, but before I ask it, where can we point people towards? What what should they check out as far as Jen Sparrow goes? Go to our website, jensparrow.com. Um, and if you're Chinese, we have a Chinese version of our website. That's how committed we are to developing this molecule in liver cancer in Asia. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's constantly being updated. You'll see it change over time. And then for clinical trial information, clinicaltrials.gov. That is an extraordinary resource for all patients and their families. Yeah. Yeah. So Genspera is G-E-N-S-P-E-R-A, and we'll link it up as well, dot com. Um, Craig, my last question is, what's a day in the life look like for you? What time do you wake up? What, um, <laughs> what does it look like to be a public CEO founder? Well, what you know is at the end of your day, you don't know when it's going to end. So <laughs> the beginning of the day, you have a little control. Yeah, do you have a routine in the morning? Yeah. 4.30, 30 in the morning, somewhere between there. Have coffee on the back porch while it's quiet. And usually go for a walk around sunrise because that's when the birds are singing. Mm -hmm. And then it's to the office or travel, whatever. If I'm on the road, I'm on the road a lot. But you never know when the end of the day is. So your only, your only routine you have control over is first thing in the morning. What do you spend most of your time on throughout the day, typically? Communication. You know, keeping the team together. Uh, I'm not a big fan of meetings, but constant communication with shareholders, with potential investors. Um, and then the some of the more fun ones is with the clinical investigators, you know, Meeting I had a meeting at the University of Texas San, uh, Health Science Center, San Antonio. They've got ideas for trials, and there's some really cool trials that we're going to get into mm. uh, that I'll reveal a little bit later. Some uh, things that I think will be very short and very exciting. Yeah. Well, so what final words should we leave people with? You know, I think people um, always talk about a balanced life. I'm not so sure that's whatever what I wanted. I yeah. think it's much better to be passionate. Be determined, be a little bit in balance, but be enthusiastic. You know, let's just enjoy it yeah. and do what you want to do there. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. Dr. Dean, it's been an absolute pleasure. I appreciate it. Oh, I really enjoyed this. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. Like a beach if you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand